Welcome to Widowed Too Soon, where real-life widows and widowers come together to share their stories of survival, faith, and the journey of finding hope in the darkest of times. Whether you're newly widowed or have been on this journey for some time, each week we're here to provide you with inspiration, practical advice, and the reassurance that you are not alone. You were made to not only survive, but thrive. And now here's your host, a woman who has walked this path herself, who finds solace in writing, joy in speaking, and freedom in dancing like nobody's watching, Michelle Bader Eversall. Welcome to Widow Too Soon. This is Michelle Bader Ebersol. We are back with another guest interview. I am so excited. I, I've heard good feedback that you guys are loving um, the focus on guests. And so we're going to get right into it again. I don't bore you with all my stuff. Maybe like once a month, I'll come on here and tell you all my stuff. Plus, as you guys know, September 12th, I'm launching Live Well with Michelle if you want to hear more of my personal stuff. But I'm excited because I am sitting here with let me see if I say it right. Rima Toll, is that correct? I should have asked you before we started. Very close. Rima. Oh, yes. right. Like Rima, even though there's an E, you say it like an A. I yes. should have asked you. I'm yes. so sorry. Rima, <laughs> no that's worries. a beautiful name. Like, does that have a specific okay. meaning? Like, did it come from somewhere in your family or what's the, what is the origin of that? Yeah. So it's actually a Greek word and it's used oh. in the New Testament several times. Um, it means the spoken word of God revealed to your heart. So, oh, you know, beautiful. When yeah, um, that's quite a party trick. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, when you're reading the Bible and all of mm -hmm. a sudden just this one scripture jumps out at you, that's a yeah. real word. It's like God's relevant Love word it. for you today. Mm hmm Yep. That is awesome. I'm going to remember that when I have a word stick out to me. That's a rhema word. Yes, I love it. Totally. <laughs> yes. Well, thanks for being here today. And we'd love if you just share with the audience. We'll just start with, tell us about how you met your late husband and your life with him. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be yes. here. So my late husband, his name is Matt. And mm -hmm. We actually met when I was a little kid. Um, mm. We were 10 years apart, but my okay. parents played on a worship team with him at the church our families were all going to. Um, and then I actually knew his sister, Joanna, more. She was our youth group, youth group leader for me later on in my okay. teen years. Um, so I went to I went away for college and all sorts of things. And after college, I moved back home and Matt and I met again, actually on another worship team. It was like for a college group that our church had started. Yeah. And uh, we just hit it off right away. Um, mm. I remember we went to Starbucks and had coffee and then that turned into dinner. And then the next day we went out to breakfast and it was just like from then on out, we were inseparable. Oh. Um, yeah, so that was really awesome. And the 10 year difference, I mean, we would always joke that it was five years less mature and I was five years more mature. So it's like perfect in the middle. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So we got married in July of 2010. Okay. Yes. Nice. Um, and were you, I know you live in Colorado now. Were you living there at that time? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, so we we're and both did... in Colorado and we've all had had our family here and everything. Yeah. Oh, nice. Okay. And so then what was life like when you got married? Did you have kids right away? Were you guys uh, were you working? What was what was your life like? Yeah, so right when we first got married, um, we bought this little foreclosure house on the front range of Colorado and we're fixing it up and we mm -hmm. both had jobs. Um, I actually was doing grad school and teaching, um, and then Matt oh, wow. in IT. Mm -hmm. um, and then we had our daughter Eliana in 2013. Mm. So three years in, um, and all throughout that time, Matt continued to work. Sometimes it was in, um, IT jobs. Other, there was another time where he was a pastor, like an associate pastor for a couple of years. And then, um, I kept going to grad school and having more babies. So I ended up like going all the way through and getting my PhD, um, in 2021 and had Ellie, oh. Asa and Maceo. So all three of my kids, um, through that process. And then Matt oh. was there just absolutely cheering me on and supporting me the whole way. So, oh, that's so cute. Did you say one of the names is Asa? 
Yes. Oh, that's one of Joel's daughter's names too. I oh, really? love that. Yeah. How do you guys spell it? ASA, but my okay. ace is actually boy. <laughs> so. Oh, okay. Interesting. You know, what we've, I've heard both because hers is E I S S A. Okay. So that makes sense. But I do remember like in high school meeting an ASA who was a boy, A S A. Uh -huh. Anyways, side note, love the name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So you had the three kids, and then, um, you know, what, what kind of happened from there? Yeah. So the last year of like the school part of my PhD, um, I was pregnant with Maceo and we were living in student housing in Fort Collins, Colorado, okay. at, um, Colorado state university there. And, um, I just started applying for jobs actually all over the country. And cause I knew I wanted to find a, a tenure track faculty position at a university and we actually got an acceptance to come to Colorado Mesa university, which is on the far Western side of the state. And so, um, Maceo was like two months old. We packed up and we moved here and bought a house. It was like, there were five wow. houses to choose from. We picked one, we just uprooted everything. Um, and so that was in 2019, the summer of, and, and then, yeah. What were you teaching? What do you teach at university? So yeah, I teach in what's called the mass communication program. My background's in journalism. Um, so I worked as a reporter oh, okay. for a couple years. Awesome. And then, yeah, yeah. So that's what oh, I teach now. <laughs> okay. And so you guys had moved to this new area. Is this mm -hmm. where you live now? The place that you it moved is. to? Yeah. Okay. And kind of like uprooted everything. And um, mm -hmm. what was he doing for work? So it was crazy. God totally provided a work from home job for awesome. that, um, the year before mm -hmm. we left. And so it made it just such a seamless transition. And mm -hmm. it was with a company he really loved and enjoyed um, and excelled at. Like he moved up into management with them. And so, yeah, we basically just started this whole new life and um, started mm -hmm. building community and just like went for it. So, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Oh, that's awesome. And then, um, Tell us what life was like when things started to change. Yeah, I've actually been reflecting on this a lot this past week because I know our conversation was coming up. Um, right. You know how a lot of times we talk about how God provides for us and we talk about it in a way where it's like blessing upon blessing upon blessing. It's all good, mm -hmm. um, right. which he totally does. But I've been reflecting on how God was preparing my family with community knowing that Matt was going to pass away. Wow. It like gives me goosebumps thinking about it. Right. So we, we moved to this little town that's outside of Grand Junction and um, we just decided, Hey, we're going to plug in here as much as we can. Let's find a church here. Let's have our dentist here. Like we're going to yeah. embrace this small town. And the church community we found was just amazing. And I've never been in a situation like that where I was so rapidly plugged in, like just right. had small group right away where we clicked with everyone. I mean, like I said, it was, it felt unnatural almost. Mm -hmm. Um, and so two, let's say three years into our time here. Yeah. 19, 20, 21, 22. Um, we had been super involved with the church. Matt and I both are worship leaders and that's mm -hmm. been a big part of our marriage, like either in official capacities yeah. or just in volunteering. And so we were doing a lot of volunteering at our church in Palisade and, um, Matt got sick one weekend. He was mm -hmm. having, we thought it was a tension headache. Like we went to urgent care a couple of times and they gave him muscle relaxers, but, um, it turned out he was actually having a heart attack. And oh, when wow. he, we got to the hospital, they stopped it and they said, oh, there's actually evidence that you've had several heart attacks and your heart has all of this scarring on it. Whoa. Um, it just sideswiped us. You know, we had no And clue. how old was he at this time? He was 45. Oh, wow. Happened. So young. Yeah. Yeah. It was crazy because he always had great checkups, great labs. Like, right. Was the healthy, active person. Um, so why I mentioned community, though, is that very week where... Matt went to the hospital. We were actually moving up the block to a new house and literally 150 people showed up to help us move in our community. Whoa. Yeah. One of my That's friends, amazing. Brittany, she looks at me, she's like, give me your move. And I said, what do you mean? She's like, I'm, <laughs> I'm like taking over your move because you have wow. to go to the hospital. And she did. It was like, people just showed up one after another. Um, I, it was, I was just blown away. Um, and so it was just this vibrant community who just 
supported us and then kept supporting us all through Matt's health journey and decline. Yeah. Mm. So. so they tell you he's already, he's having a heart attack. He's already had a bunch that, and you were sideswiped. And then what happened from there? Yeah. So they uh, diagnosed him with advanced heart failure and essentially his Ooh. heart was operating at like 20% capacity. Oh my goodness. And so that first summer, um, they put in a stint and then put on a monitor that would send data, but then also shock him if he needed it. Um, and then after that three month process, he actually started having these heart racing episodes. It was mm. like his heart would just kick into 130, 140 and wouldn't stop. The only way it would stop would be to go to the ER and they would cardiovert him. And so we are like two months into that kind of stuff where it would just be middle of the night, mm. beginning of the day. I mean, we were just kind of always on edge, right? wondering when it was time to go to the hospital next. And uh, they tried a couple of, it's called ablations. And that's where they go in and they burn out circuits of the heart to try to track oh. down where the racing is coming from. Cause it's, it's almost like the circuit is getting stuck and telling the heart to, to keep pumping uh, the blood mm -hmm. that quickly. And so we did one ablation and it worked for a little bit. And then the heart racing started again. So this was the fall of 2022. Okay. Um, and then Matt was scheduled for another ablation in November of 2022. And when the doctor here got into the procedure, he actually stopped immediately and said, this man needs a pacemaker and um, the circuits that are malfunctioning are actually in the bottom chambers of the heart, which is very dangerous. Oh. And when that type of racing is happening, it's indicative of um, a heart attack or more heart attacks. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Matt got that pacemaker put in and then um, continued to have more heart racing. We tried all these different medications um, and then in the spring of 2023, we transferred to Denver um, to a hospital there because they had a, you know, pretty world renowned research heart clinic. And the doctors here said, we don't know what to do anymore. You're like one in a million, you know, what's going wow. on with your heart. You just can't quite put a pin on it. Um, so yeah, in the spring of 2023, Matt went in for, they call it a ventricular ablation. So the bottom two chambers of his heart. And it was like a crazy six hour thing where they put him under and, um, he had a lot of complications with it, but after that, his heart actually really did stop racing. Mm. And so we came back to Palisade and, um, enjoyed actually several months of kind of normal, like this color started coming back wow. into his skin. Um, we were, we ended up taking like a bunch of trips that summer. We went to go see family and friends and we had like a cousin week with all of my nephews and my mm. niece. And like, it was just this beautiful summer. And in July of 2023, we went back for his checkup with the cardiologist in Denver. And he was like, you're doing great. Keep it up. We'll see you in six months. You're improving. We're so glad to see how this is going. So, um, yeah, we had a lot of hope that Matt was pulling out of it and, you know, he'd be recovering in one way or another. Um, but then it was August 4th of 2023 and I was getting ready to go to an academic conference. I was going to fly out the next day and we had like a picnic to go to that night with our church. And so we show up to the park and we're just hanging out and, my friend, Jesse, he just grabs me. He's like, Rayma, Rayma, come over here. And I look and Matt is like, he's just not there. And he's choking. Yeah. Um, oh, scary. And yeah, so we got him on the ground and there was a couple of nurses there. So we started doing CPR and I just kept thinking like, this is just like every other time, right? Like every right. other time his heart has raced. Um, we're going to make it through. But when I got to the hospital later that day, a chaplain met me and I just knew I was like, Oh no, right. <laughs> this is not, mm -hmm. this is not what I was hoping for. And, um, yeah, they performed CPR on him for like two hours and they could get his heart to kind of come back for a little bit, but then it would fade away for 20 minutes. And, you know, the doctor just looked at me and he's like, he's not here. You know, oh. I'm sorry. We can keep trying, but you know, he, if you look at his pupils and his eyelids, like, 
he basically is brain dead and oh my um, goodness so like in that emergency room moment I just kind of had to make the call of hey you know I think it's time for him to go and I knew his wishes I knew he wouldn't want to be in a vegetative state um even if we could have kept trying I just felt a lot of peace about letting him go yeah oh wow that's so hard and how old were your kids at the time so they were 10, 7, and 4, and we were actually all there at the park. Okay, so they all happened. saw it. Yep. So what what was this like for them? Because they probably, like you, were thinking he was getting better and all of that. So how, how did they react to all of this? It has been a harrowing year parenting them, that's for sure. Um definitely they've gone through phases where they're angry at me because I you know told them dad was getting better Mm. Um, and then they go back to like oh we understand mom that it's you know not your fault that he had a heart attack but kind of some trust issues around that now and now I feel like I can never say to them (laughs) any absolutes Mm. (laughs) like they'll ask me our dog was at the vet the other day and my daughter was just like can you promise me the dog's going to make it? And I was like, I actually can't. Can't. Yeah. Hmm. So just stepping away from that innocence or that shelter into real life. um, Right. So quickly for them. So yes. Yeah. Lots of issues with that. Lots of um, like, for example, when uh, sirens go off, um, a few of my kids just Mm -hmm. kind of have that freeze response and I have to. Yes sit there and try to help them, you know, I switch, try to switch them in the left brain. Like we, we count and, you know, try to do multiplication and things like that, just to kind of help them get out of that frozen terror space. Right. So That is definitely hard. I, I believe my kids have some trauma around ambulances. I know I do. Like it's when I hear an ambulance, cause we, I was just telling Joel the other day, I'm like, Cause, oh, we were watching a show and something about ambulance. And I was like, that's not how it goes, you know, cause I've been in ambulance and I'm like, have you ever ridden an ambulance with anyone? He's like, no. And I was like, well, I've done it a lot of times. <laughs> and I was just like counting all the times. And like, so every time I hear an ambulance, I get it. It's the same kind of, um, same kind of things. So you guys are all totally shocked because you thought he was getting better what is it like in the very beginning? Let's say like that day, that night, the next day, what, what is life like for you? Man, I think the craziest thing, uh, my friend Lauren was with me that night in the ER. Mm. We were just talking about it yesterday and she goes, I think it's insane that all of a sudden they just hand you all this paperwork. Like you're sitting in the room, your husband has just passed away and they give you this mountain to work through. And they're asking you questions like, where do you want him to go? Like, do you oh have an itinerary that you want? I mean, and I'm just sitting there having this out of body experience, right? Where I'm like, this can't be me. I feel like I'm above myself watching a movie of this person going through this tragedy. Um, and so that's kind of how I, the space I lived in for several weeks. It was like, this can't be me. <laughs> I can't accept this. This doesn't happen to me. This doesn't happen to my kids. Um, so kind of that numb protection that, I've heard a lot of grief groups talk about grief books talk about. I totally had that for at least a good month. Oh yeah. Um, And I also remember uh, Matt and I co-parented really well. Like we just had this routine where, yeah, you know, we knew how to put the kids to bed, uh, sorry, the kids to bed. And um, all of a sudden it was like, I have to do this all on my own. Yeah. And it just felt so daunting and overwhelming and um, just kind of, oppressive in a lot of ways, just thinking like, okay, I have to figure out how to carry my grief, carry my kids' grief. It's just been a lot for sure. Yeah. I think that's one of the hardest things when you have kids, specifically kids at home, who you are, you've got your own grief for your husband, your marriage, not just your husband, your marriage is over all of a sudden. And then you're carrying the grief of your kids and trying to be strong for them, but you're handling your own grief. And so it's a very, very difficult place to be. And you have to continue to, you know, make them dinner and do all the things, even though you can barely take care of yourself. 
And so that, that is difficult. So did you, you know, you, you mentioned your friend, Lauren, did you have other people come and surround you and like stay with you? Or what was that like that first little while? Yeah. Kind of going back to that community theme, um, mm -hmm. you know, definitely lots of family came right away. And then, um, my church just really continued to support me. Like, I don't think I actually cooked dinner for three months. Meals just nice. Kept up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I live in a pretty small town where people just feel okay with dropping by. So people dropped by a lot to check in. Um, it wasn't too much. It was a good balance. I felt like they had, you know, good taste with all of that. Um, and whenever I needed help with the kids or things like that, I mean, people just were there surrounding us every step of the way. Um, and I know I'm very fortunate in that. I feel like I've heard some other widow and widower yeah. stories where that's really not the case. And mm -hmm. I just felt so buoyed by all of them um, that I, I just, I'm just in awe, you know, of that they would continue to care for me in that way. Um, right. even now actually about a year out. So, wow. yeah. So, so then when, when did life start to get better? I mean, we always miss them, but when did you start to feel better? Mm -hmm. Um, what kind of things helped you that kind of thing? Yeah, I think, a lot of that for me revolves around music actually. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. I, so I've been a musician, like a singer and I play the piano my whole life. And I know I mentioned like, I've done a lot of worship leading. Um, and when Matt passed away, I, my voice, I literally couldn't sing. It was the craziest oh, thing. Wow. It was like this physical phenomenon where I would try or I don't know. And it just felt like it just choked right here. And I, I couldn't get anything out. And so I just kept like worship music pumping through our house from the moment we woke up to when we went to bed. And, um, but I was dealing with a lot of really deep depression. Like it would just I'm sure. press down on me. And, um, and then I ended up going to another conference, um, called the never alone widows. Conference. Oh yes. Yeah. I've heard great things. Yeah. So I went in February and before I went, I decided to ask God for a few specific things. And one of them was that I wanted, I asked him to restore my song, to restore my mm. voice. And um, we got there and it was this room of like 400 other widows. Oh, and there wow. Was something so powerful about that. Yeah, like, I'm sure. <laughs> walking into the room and knowing that you don't have to have any pretenses. You can talk about all the hard stuff. Um and they did a lot of worship sessions as well. And there was one session where I just felt like the Lord told me to like lift up my hands while I was worshiping. And I felt the depression just like break off of me. That wow. Really deep, dark depression. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm not going to tear up about it. No, <laughs> tears are healing. <laughs> right. I'm not supposed what to we feel, we heal. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're right. It's true. It's true. Um, so you don't have to apologize, especially here. <laughs> right. It's a good safe space. Um, it is. Yeah. And so I was able to just start singing a little bit. Wow. And I didn't feel this like, oh, I'm, you know, so thankful. And I'm like gloriously worshiping or, you know, doing all these joyful songs. But it was just, I was in awe that God had started restoring that. And um, the actually last service of the conference, the last song they played was one that we had done at Matt's funeral. And I was just standing there and I was able to sing a little bit with it and worship to it. And so I just knew I had this marker. It was like this divider of I'm healed from a lot of things. Not that grief ever goes away or, mm -hmm. you know, there weren't dark and hard times, but it was like that deep depression, that lockdown of myself really started to fade away at that conference. Mm. So, yeah, I really feel like there was just that moment for me. That's amazing that literally your voice came back mm -hmm. at the retreat. That's so great. So did you do any like counseling or grief share or grief classes? What kind of things did you do? Yeah, I did a mix. Um, I, Matt and I had actually been seeing a counselor together mm -hmm. for a couple of years before he passed away. And I continued to see her and it was kind of comforting because she knew him so well. Yes. We could really talk through a lot of my grief around some loose ends, right. That weren't wrapped up and right. You know, and it was almost like she knew how I know how he'd respond. And <laughs> um, right. Oh, so that's amazing. That was, yeah. That was helpful. I met with her 
weekly for a while. And then now it's kind of spread out to about once a month. Um, and then I did go through grief share in the fall and my experience was okay. I was with, it was definitely an older crowd, which I don't usually mind, Mm -hmm. but I feel like they just looked at me with so much pity. They were, cause they were like, well, I'm a widow, but I'm 70. And I'm like, and they'd be like, well, but you're 36 and you have kids. I don't, I can't even imagine how you're doing this. And I just said, and I'm like, thank you. I think. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of when I branched out and was like, started leaning into podcast communities, you know, found widowed too soon. Mm -hmm. Um, started connecting through more Facebook communities and Instagram communities. And, um, so that's where I found a lot of my support actually around grief. Mm -hmm. And what I see that you're doing, that's so important. So, you know, I, I do grief recovery classes and one of the things I learned through grief recovery is that it, I used to say to people like, Oh, it'll just get better you know, with time. But what I learned, it's what you do with the time. And what I see that you've done is you've searched out resources and tools and help. And that's why you are doing good is because it's the time plus what you do with the time. And so the fact that you did that, and I believe that's why my healing happened so quickly is because I dove into, I went to a retreat two months after I was reading every book I could find. My whole life was obsessed with getting better. (laughs) And I think, you know, I can see that about yourself too. And so because you did that, you know, you're, you're doing well, we will always miss them. I know you guys have heard this. Well, maybe if you're not, if you're a new listener, but um, it's been compared that losing someone is like having an amputation, which Luke had one. So I can easily relate to this. It's like that part of you will always be missing. Like you'll always miss them, but you learn to live with it. And I think that that's how it is for all of our losses. We will always miss them, but we learn to live with it. And we'll have those moments when we have, you know, this is a real thing that Luke used to get called phantom pain, where it feels like the limb is like on fire or burning. Like it was horrible. used to keep him up all the time, but you might have that in your grief. You have a moment when you're like, I think I'm going to die. This hurts so bad, but you feel it and then it goes away. And that's, that's how it is with grief. You know, we can have these immense losses and these pain and these feelings like we're not going to make it. But if we let ourselves feel it, then we can heal it. Well, God heals it, not us. But um, I love that. I love that you were already, you know, months in just like seeking out ways to get help. Um, So then, you know, what happens after that? Um, I, I, I mean, I know, but I'm trying to lead into this, like the big changes that happened in your life after this. You get home from the retreat and then what is life like after that? Yeah. Um, I felt open to dating again, actually at that mm-hmm. point. So I was about six months out and I kind of thought to myself, I don't even know where to meet someone. I mean, right? I I'm like in my late thirties and I don't go to bars and I don't know, like yeah. I don't even meet someone. Uh huh. <laughs> so I, I started trying some online dating. I, did a couple of bigger apps and it was just exhausting. I yeah, know, uh-huh. had a few phone conversations and went out to one coffee date and I was just about ready to drop, you know, hop off. Cause I was like, maybe it's just not the right time. And yeah, you know, we'll just kind of see. And, um, it was actually through Facebook dating. I got a like from a man named Brian in Cheyenne. And what I loved about Facebook dating is that it shows you who you have in common Yes. And, yes. That's where I started too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Didn't work out for me, you know, but <laughs> yes, I know yes. what you're talking about. You could see, like, actually I was so afraid in the beginning that I would turn off the feature. Like I didn't want them to know that we knew anyway. Anyways, but later on yeah. I turned on the feature so I could see who the friends were. And then I'd go ask the mutual friend, what do you think of this person? And they'd be like, wait, they're on dating. Like one of them was like, wait, I thought they were still married. And I was like, Oh, okay. I'm not touching that one. <laughs> But anyways, I didn't mean to interrupt your story, just that I can relate to Facebook dating. So go ahead, Facebook dating. Well, really, I mean, I agree. It's like that made me more comfortable because I mm-hmm. I could contact. It was this guy I went to high school with that was Brian's cousin. Um, mm. And I actually never ended up contacting him. But what I did do is I met Brian's aunt who lives mm. in my town about two weeks into us really talking and um, it just helped to have that like personal connection. So even before I met Brian in person, I started meeting other family members and people in his life. So <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love that. Kind of a backwards way to go about it, but it it's what worked for us for sure. 
So how did you know that he was different than anybody else? Like what, tell us a little bit about your, your love story. Yeah. Um, just right away as we were talking, um, he, Brian is very loyal and fierce about his family. Um, I noticed Mm. right away that they are who he's about. Um, he doesn't always like his job, he, you know, but his yeah. passion is his kids and doing the best for them and protecting them and having fun with them. And so I was drawn to that right away. And then the second thing was that um, he didn't even bat an eye about Matt because it's like Matt's in our relationship. You know, he yeah. lives on in me. He lives on in the kids. And if we're going to go any further, you just you got to be with someone who is going to be OK with with Matt being there, too. And, you know he's very intentional. Like he often asks me questions about Matt. Um, when I have a, a grief day coming up that I know is at least coming up, um, he's just, what do you need? Like, how can we kind of help facilitate this? Um, and so just that openness. And then also right away, he just like completely accepted my kids as his own. Wow. Um, and then I was also falling in love with his personality. Like he's so funny and great conversationalist. Um, we have, you know, a lot in common in a lot of ways. And so when we met in person, um, I had like a, a work awards dinner to go to in Denver and he met me down there for our first date. And it just felt like we hadn't even stopped talking. And it was like, we just kind of picked up where we left off. It wasn't awkward. And yeah. So even that weekend I was kind of like, okay, I think this is it for me. (laughs) Um, Wow. It was yeah. Amazing. Did you ever have any grief when you first started dating? You know, actually not very much. I know that sounds kind of strange, but I had processed so much and was ready to start dating. And I feel like I've actually not had very many moments of comparison, like maybe Mm -hmm. not even one that I can even think of right now. For some reason, I've been able to just kind of go, this was my love story with Matt. And now this is my love story with Brian and it's not like I'm forgetting Matt. He's still there, but, um, I definitely have days obviously where I still miss Matt, where I still talk to him. I feel like I've been going back through a cycle of being angry at Matt. Um, Mm. but it's, it has not been triggered by Brian. If that makes sense. It feels Mm -hmm. like I'm, I'm carrying my own grief in that. And then, Yeah being with Brian too. So loving these two men at the same time. (laughs) Yep. I definitely know that I recently did a post about my anniversary and how, yes, I woke up next to my amazing husband, Joel, but my heart still misses Luke and I was very sad. And so Mm -hmm. it's a concept that I don't think you can really understand unless you've been through it (laughs) because, you know, people are like, well, you mean that means you, you didn't, you know, love Luke as much or it means you don't love Joel as much. No, I love them both. And so it's, it's a really kind of a weird feeling sometimes, but yeah, you can kind of separate it into like two different chapters of your life. (laughs) And, and I've definitely, you know, had quite a bit of pushback from friends and family, Mm. even when I just wanted to start dating. And I finally realized that it was them not processing their grief or them being on a different timeline and how I started that's good like hey you know what I have been in this day and night like I'm living in the same house where he passed away and we live life together raising these kids that are ours I mean I have no choice but to push through all of this where yeah (laughs) everyone else they can take a break from missing Matt and not that they aren't grieving or you know they're doing it wrong so good but for me it was like no I really am in a good place where I'm carrying both of these stories and I feel like this is the right direction for our family. And so I'm just so ready good. To, go, to go for it. Yeah. I've never thought about it that way that that might be that they are not processing their grief. That's so good. Like what a light bulb moment to realize that that's what it's about because nobody can judge our timeline and like, all of those things. Like sometimes if someone will bring up, oh, well, they got married this quick. I'm like, so it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean they loved their spouse any less, like at all. That's not what it means. Cause I mean, I've had on TikTok where there's all the haters, you know, I don't even know them. Oh, you must not have loved your spouse. Cause you started dating again. You must not, have, you know, you got married again. You must not have loved him. I'm like, what in what world is that? How it works? Like it's not. Yep. 
So you guys have this first great date. And so you were long distance. Like how far away did you guys we're live? We're six hours apart, actually. Oh, yeah. six hours. Okay. Mm -hmm. So how did you navigate that long distance relationship? Yeah. I mean, we just started you know, spending as much time as we could together. I, my job is actually, I have the summers off. Um, awesome. So the best. <laughs> <laughs> we kind of packed up and moved over to uh, like my parents' house in, mm. you know, which they're about an hour or so, or so away from Brian. Okay. Um, just did summer over there and like really got to know each other more and, you know, just started doing everyday life stuff together and then, but we've always, Brian and I have always talked a lot on the phone and just, you know, kept up over texting a lot throughout the day. Um, and so we somehow we just figured it out and started making it work. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. <laughs> so then tell me about when he proposed. Yes. So I, honestly, we were just hanging out and I <laughs> looked over and he was down on one knee and said, will you marry me? Like it, <laughs> It was and you wonderful. weren't like expecting it or anything. It was no. just like a surprise, but you, right. you knew you wanted to marry him, right? Like yeah. he wasn't like just guessing you'd say yes. Like, <laughs> right. Right. He knew. Yeah. Well, and I think what's hard about online dating and then also with thinking about all these kids, cause we have six kids between us. Right. Wow. Um, <laughs> is pretty early on. We had to have a good DTR right? To find the yep. relationship. Oh my like, gosh. We used we... to use that term back in high school. <laughs> Have you had the DTR yeah. yet? <laughs> right. Let's bring back that. I love that term. <laughs> Anyways. Okay. You had a good DTR. Just haven't heard that for a while. Right. <laughs> I know I was. Yeah. And it just, it's like, we had to make some choices. Are we going forward together or do we need to split ways? And we need to make this choice before we involve all of these hearts. Cause it's not just him and I. Yeah. It's, that's a lot. It's, this whole family. And so, yeah, I just, I already knew that I was making that choice. I felt a lot of peace about that direction for my family um, and for our new combined family. And so, yeah, I wasn't surprised, but mm. it was beautiful. So <laughs> when it. was the proposal? May 4th. Okay. Of this past year. Yes. Okay. Of 24. Mm -hmm. So then you got busy planning your wedding. What was, what was that like? Um, what was it like telling your kids you were getting married? It was, it was actually pretty rough. They mm -hmm. were upset. Um, that's hard, but after they processed it, um, all of them have had different responses over time. Yeah. Like my boys are younger and have been very excited. Um, my daughter has been pretty angry and hesitant about yeah. it all, um, yeah. the whole way through. So, you know, I just kept working with my counselors and seeking advice and, you know, I'm just learning how to be continuing to learn how to be very open to her and her responses and what she needs, but also kind of trying to create some boundaries like, Hey, I'm the mom, you're the kid, you know, this is mm -hmm. hard for all of us. Um, yeah. So that was definitely mixed reactions and that's, that's a grief in itself, right? Yeah, like, definitely. Usually the first time we all got married, you know, there's a lot of joy yeah. in the communities and now it's just complicated. Yeah. And it's almost like you just have to have to go, okay, all these other people, again, they're having their grief and I'm letting them into my life. But at the same time, like I have all this joy. I see where I've come from. I see where I'm going and I'm going to trust God's plan around it all. And mm -hmm. so that's kind of helped me try to be empathetic with everyone, but also just keep moving forward with what I feel like is the right path. Right. So you got engaged in um, May and then when did you get married? So we got married July 16th. We did it Exciting. all pretty quickly. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. We wanted the kids to all be there, um, you know, because of custody and all these different things, you know, happening right. on all sides of our family. Um, that was just the week that worked out for our schedules. And then, um, I had a pretty big wedding the first time around and I knew I didn't want that the second time around. And so mm -hmm. we just kept it super simple. Like we drove up a mountain here and Aww. hopped out of the car, the side of a lake with a pastor. And then actually quite a bit of our family and friends came too. We just got married on the side of the lake. And then, sure. um, some dear friends hosted like a barbecue for us afterwards where we had water games for the kids and that kind of stuff. Oh, fun. And it was just absolute perfect day, like fit our new family um, in so many yeah. ways. Yeah. 
Oh yeah, I saw some pictures that looked really, really beautiful and it was just gorgeous. You, you look so happy and I just mm-hmm. there's something special about love after loss. Like it's just something like where I feel like you appreciate it so much more. <laughs> like and that yeah. loss may be the loss of a spouse or maybe the loss of a marriage because of a divorce. Um, right. you know, and so when either way, when you experience love again after you've lost it in a marriage, it's amazing. Like it just feels so Good. I am. I know that for both myself and Joel, that we both really appreciate the love. Um, you know, after having such loss in our lives, um, that's so beautiful. So you got married in July, and tell us what life is like now in uh, September or uh, well, September yeah. when it aired. Well, right, no, end of August, <laughs> August, September, whenever we air this. <laughs> yeah. Um. So we are living apart this year, and. Um, seeing each other at least once a month. Um, again, with my schedule, you know, I'll have like a bigger Christmas break so I can go, we can go be with him and that, that kind of stuff. Um, so it's definitely been a very different start to our relationship, but we felt like it was important to, to get married and then, you know, start figuring out how to put our family together. Um, and I know actually in some ways it's been a blessing because there's just a lot of things to work out when you're thinking about helping six yes. kids learn how to live with each other. I mean, you know, we can't uh-huh. force anybody to like anybody, but how can we do it in a way where everyone has the opportunity to feel included? I can't control if, you know, one of our kids is not responding well, but all I can do is just show up with love every day, show up and meet needs, like be consistent. And so even from far away, that's what my goal is. I know like that's Brian's goal too, is just to try to keep nourishing all of those relationships while we figure out all the logistics of selling houses and combining households, things like that. So yeah, it's, it it's hard. Crazy. Good. Yeah. I was talking to another widow friend who is, you know, looking at getting married pretty quickly and, you know, just, we were just talking about, isn't it crazy how much God can do in a year? Like, like your life looks completely different than a year ago. And, um, it's like, you could have never written this love story. Only God could, you know, how he puts the details together and your families together. And just, it's absolutely amazing. And I'm so happy for you. And I'm glad that you don't let, um, as you know, like the haters, I know you don't really have any haters, but people who don't get it, you know, that you don't let that affect you and you realize, whoa, that's them, not me. Like, um, that's brilliant. (laughs) Well, you know, sometimes I feel like what I say is, Hey, you know what? I hope you never are in my shoes. I hope you actually never have to understand why I'm doing what I'm doing or how I'm reacting or my timeline of anything like genuinely. (laughs) And I try to say that in a way to kind of get them to to, to get off my back as well, but also trying to empathize with them. Like they actually don't know what's going on. They don't know how they would respond when they're in the same situation. And so I want to be the person who's there for my friends when they're going through similar tragedies and they can come to me and I can be like, I totally get it now. Right. I can walk with you through this crazy, um, trash dumpster can of emotions. And (laughs) yeah, the the process of grief is so, so bizarre. Um, and I'm here for it. You're not crazy. I totally get it. You know, I want to be the person for my community as well. Yeah. I remember early in my grief and I was just starting to step back into the dating world. One of my good friends said to me, I could never get married again, or I could never date again if my husband died. And I actually told her, you know, I I don't think you should say that. I hope you're never in this position, but you don't know, you know? And then she was like, oh, okay, sorry. (laughs) Like you, you really don't know. (laughs) Like, cause yeah. I mean, I, I can see now being married again. I could see where that comes from. Like the feelings I'm feeling right now at this moment, I would never want to date anybody, but Joel. So I get it. And I get it when you're in that moment, in that life, you cannot imagine it, but that's not really fair to, you know, say to people, um, because you don't, you don't know. And we should never, I learned this in grief recovery too, is like, even to another widow, I can't say to you, I know, under, like, I understand how you feel because we have different situations. I can understand some of what you feel, you know, right. and there is that bond with widows, but I can't know exactly. I'm not, I didn't live your life and your loss and your situation. Um, so it's really important that we don't, no matter what in life, say to people like, oh, I totally get it. But you can say, you know, I understand parts of what you're feeling, but not exactly. Only you're the one who gets what you feel like. And so, yeah, yeah, I think you have an amazing story of, you know, being open, like, 
first of all, seeking out the healing. Like I don't think in, I mean, I don't know, I'm not God, but you probably wouldn't have gotten married again if you haven't really dove into your own healing, you know, before you got married. And then I love what you talked about that, you know, he had to understand that Matt is part of you and the kids, you know, and that I tell that to people when people come with advice, they're dating someone and the, oh yeah, he's not really okay with it. Okay. Then he needs to leave because your late spouse is part of your life. And if he doesn't get it now, when you're dating, you don't want to marry him (laughs) because you're going to have grief days and you're going to have all that. You need somebody who respects it and gets it. So when was the year anniversary? August, early August, right? Yeah. August 4th. Okay. So you were married to Brian at that time. Um, Mm -hmm. So how was that for you? Because you got to experience this weird thing when you're married again, but you know, it, what was that like for you that day? I mean, it was the first anniversary, so that's always a hard one. Yeah. I mean, at least for me, in my experience. Um, so I'm finding that how I grieve is very anticipatory oriented. Mm, and yeah. so I have just started to realize, okay, maybe there's this anniversary date or there's a birthday or whatever. Yeah. It was special to me about me and Matt. And about a week before I start feeling super down, I cry at the drop of a hat. I feel like I relive some of the trauma memories of what's going on. And I finally go, okay, this is me getting ready for the day. And Mm -hmm. then the day of is usually not too bad for me personally. Um, Yeah. So that was my experience with my one year anniversary too. Um, Just a lot of sadness and heaviness and feeling like I just wanted to crawl away and hide away in my bed and, you know not engage with the world at all. And then the day of me and the kids were just like watching tons of funny videos. And like, I had all the kids pick out like one thing they wanted to do. So we watched a star Wars movie because Matt loves star Mm -hmm. Wars and we got ice cream together and, um, you know, talked about that a lot and watched, yeah. Like watch those funny videos of him in there with the kids. And yeah, so it felt more like this day of remembering instead of Mm -hmm. being totally controlled by, traumatic grief. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Um, unrelated question, but wondering, Mm -hmm. did you keep your same last name? Like as the kids, did you hyphen? Did you, what did, cause everyone does it differently. I'm just curious what you decided to do. (laughs) Yeah. Um, no, I decided to take Brian's name. So, okay. So is that toll toll is his? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I didn't know if that was yours. His. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's different for everybody. So, you know, I took, so legally I'm ever slow. I took his name, but then I, I went back and I tried to change it, but I'd already changed the social security. I kind of wanted to change my middle name to Bader to have it match the kids. But then my mom was like, um, that's the name I gave you. So anyways, I never legally <laughs> changed it, but every time I find myself, even for college, when we Haley, dropped Haley off at college, I kept, I sign it Bader Ebersole because yeah. I want them to know I'm connected to her. And, you know, so I do that. So I just, I'm always curious and I've had friends who have hyphenated and, you know, I think that's another really personal decision, you know, with whatever you decide. Well, and I think in a lot of ways, like at their schools, you know, if someone calls me Mrs. Layton or Raymond's Layton, I'm not going to be, get all angry or anything like that. Yeah. You know, the kids associate that. Yeah. Layton is my previous Okay. Name. That's right. Um, mm-hmm. Layton. Okay. Yes. And so you know, I'm not trying to like stamp that out or anything for them, but I definitely, yeah, felt like it was important to mark that change for yeah my chapter two story and right, but just also acknowledging there's still room for my whole story, yeah, in my present. Mm-hmm. Exactly, exactly. So you're, you know, you're still fairly baby widow, but you have lived a lot in the last year. So what advice would you give to like? a brand new, like newborn widow, like a first few months into this. Yeah. I, when I thought about this, my answer would be to honor your reduced capacity. I think in our American culture, especially, um, we see doing and being and growing as the most important thing in our existence. And I am that driven usually of a person. I'm always like reading self-help books and improving, you know, working. I research in my field of media sociology, like I'm just always improving. And all of that just got wiped out for the first six months for sure. 
And I've learned to see that though, as a blessing in the middle of all of my ashes, because it's almost like the slate got wiped clean and I could be much more intentional about what to add back in. And my body will tell me when I'm adding too much back in or my brain mm-hmm. will. It's like, I just, whoop, yep. That was one too many things. Yep. I'm not committed <laughs> to that. <laughs> it's enough. Usually most days just to try to feed everyone and do laundry and go to work in school. And yeah, you, know, you got a lot going it. on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's such good advice. No one's given that advice before. I really like oh, that. Cool. <laughs> yeah, that's really great. And so I know that music has been very important to you. So did you have any specific songs or verses that helped you through your hard time? Yes, I actually have a playlist I thought I can share with you. Ooh, if, if you yeah, we'll notes. put it. We one. will. Yeah, um, I called it Rewire My Heart. And Ooh, that's good. It's songs I put on when I can just feel like confusion setting in or even like deeper grief moments. And um, it's songs like Eyes Locked on the King by Abby Gamboa. Mm. Um, I really love the Cageless Birds. And so several of their live sessions are on there where it's like 20 minute soaking songs. One nice. of my favorites of theirs is called, um, oh, sorry, my, that was my dog. It's That's called okay. River of Love. And it's all about oh, okay. asking the Lord to flow through our minds and our hearts and just like, until we know we're saturated with his love. So mm, oftentimes I just really need that reminder of like, there's all these complexities, there's all these sorrows, but when it comes down to it, I am loved perfectly Love by my father. So yeah, that's, I have that to give to you guys as well. <laughs> oh, thank you. I can't wait to check that out. And I'm sure other people will be excited about that too, because music definitely is healing and worship music and all of that. So what would you say is the most challenging thing about being widowed? Man, honestly, I think it was the sinking realization over and over again that someone who knew me so well is gone. Yeah. And I think the biggest takeaway I've had from Matt passing away, like at his, we had two memorial services in different locations and over and over again, people just kept saying like, Matt was the most amazing friend. He texted Mm. me all the time. He said he was praying for me. He asked if I could pray, he could pray for me. And it was like, that's what matters the most in the end. Right. And then, so I'd have this realization and then be coupled with this idea of like, but I lost that, right? I lost this person Mm -hmm. who knew in a lot of ways, watched me grow up. We grew up together, went through all of these highs and lows. Like he's (laughs) saw me give birth, like yeah, gone and (laughs) gone in an instant. And so just like recognizing that and and then going, oh, it takes quite a while to build up the intimacy again with someone, right? Because you're, yeah. for me, I was looking at 15 years total of him being in my life. Um, and so I think Hard. the identity piece is the hardest part yes. for me, at least. Because for a long time, I just felt very unanchored. Um, yep. I would consider myself a pretty like independent, you know, mm-hmm. woman who has a job and researches and has all these passions. But yeah. even then it still felt like, this other half was ripped away. I think, I think at one point I wrote about it cause I've been doing a lot of writing throughout the last That's year. That's so it. good. Said, yeah. How do you separate millions of drops of water that have been combined? Like there's just no way to do it. It's not like I can untangle myself from that. Right. Him. So. Oh, that's so yeah. powerful. So when you say writing, do you, do you journal a lot? Is that what you're doing? It's been journaling. I actually ended up doing a lot on Facebook as well. It kind okay, of that's good. My way to help everyone see where I was at, and it. Yeah. I would. I write in a lot more of like a, I guess it is journal style. It's kind of more yeah. expressing my emotions. Um, and like if if I have a moment of, of grief, I'll think through well, what caused that grief, and then I'll kind of use that to dissect my feelings and let them flow so out. Good. And then sometimes I share those on Facebook. Other times I don't. Um, yeah. But that's been very powerful. And I've had a lot of people in my life tell me like, thank you so much for helping me walk through grief with you. You know, I just did a whole year of that where I probably wrote at least once a week, if not more. Wow. Um, and so I just found that very powerful. I understand that a lot of people wouldn't want their right. emotions out there like that. But for me, it was healing to release that. And it was a good way to help people gauge where right. I was at as well. <laughs> so I think that there's so much, uh, there's a lack of grief education 
out there. And so that's why I do a lot of it. That's why I started my TikTok years ago, all these things to educate people. It does help us work through it, but also to educate people about, you know, loving two people at once and how your heart feels and like what it feels like on an anniversary when you're married again, but you are celebrating the anniversary with your late husband. And like, that's why I do those kind of things because it does help me. But then other people come back and say, thank you. Like I've had widows say, you know, thank you for helping me. Like, that's what I feel too. Like put it into words. And then other people say, thank you for helping me to see what it's like because they're not widowed, but they can understand it better. And so I think those things are super powerful to be able to do. So that's awesome. Well, I have loved hearing your stories. Is there anything else you want to say to our audience before we wrap it up in prayer? Um, you know, just that my hope for all of us walking down this road is that our creativity and our awe of beauty and life will come back again. And I know that happens so for all of us in so many different yeah. ways, but I realized like when I started noticing the sunsets again, I was like, Ooh. okay, I'm doing better. I'm going to, I'm working my, my way through this and I'm learning how to carry grief and also be present in this world. Cause that's so good. That is the beginning of grief, right? Is that you just feel yeah. like you're caught between reality yes. and heaven yep. and anything we can do, like finding beauty, intentionally slowing down and like letting moments of awe wash over us through I mean, it can be all sorts of things, right? A song through poetry, through listening to a podcast. I mean, I've had those moments often and I'm just learning how to grasp them and, and try to, I guess, really put them into my heart to help heal mm. myself and help me come back to reality. Yeah, that's so good. Thank you. Well, I'm going to go ahead and close this out in prayer. God, I just thank you so much for Rayma and for her story. Thank you for giving the courage to be here and just thank you how you have healed her heart. Thank you for Brian coming into her and her kids' lives. I just pray blessings over that family, peace over that family as they adjust um, to their new life together, God, that you would just come and cover them. And uh, we just thank you so much for her sharing her story. We pray for all the listeners today, God. I just I just pray for peace, peace that passes all understanding. And also like Rayma talked about joy. I just pray that joy will come back into their lives. If they haven't noticed a sunset, I pray they notice it. If they haven't noticed anything else that brings them joy, that today it'll just pop out at them and they'll see the joy. And we just thank you that you do give us joy and laughter and all these things that are from you. We just thank you so much for this opportunity to be here and be with our listeners and just pray blessings over everyone. Amen. Well, you know what I'm probably going to say, if you like this podcast, I'm still doing it in season four. Give it a little bing, five stars on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen which is kind of funny that I say this. I don't know if you've heard. So as of the time of recording, there's only been one of the new seasons, but I have an outro and she says to like rate review, but I'm like, I still have to say it. You know, I still have to, um, you know, give the little plug. And then the main thing I want to say is please join the Widow Too Soon community page, the smaller one, the one you have to ask to join because a couple of things like I am loving watching how, so on our other page, people can't post. So that's not fun. Only I can post. So I love it when on this page, people are posting, Hey, today's my anniversary or Hey, I'm new to this group. And I am, people are welcoming them. People are encouraging it. And, and you heal when you help others too. So it's like, this is helping everybody. And it's just, I've loved watching it. I do go to check. Um, so far, I think only one has slipped through the cracks that wasn't really widowed. I go through everyone's page and look for clues. And sometimes I'm like, not quite sure, but if they don't do anything bad, it's fine. Um, but I do go through, it takes a while, but, um, I want to make sure it's a protected community. Just side note. So today or yesterday on the other page, now I can't control who likes that page. So random guys will come through you know that they're a fake um, person when they have like a picture of a doctor or working out at the gym and it's a brand new page. And so this guy, and it pops up on my phone, like in a different way on this business page. And it was like, um, she, he was responding to all these people and it said, here's a thoughtful note to say to Janice or to whatever her name was. So he had gotten it from somebody else, forgot to erase that and just put it on there. So I immediately blocked him. I'm like, if you're going to do that, why aren't you even smart about it? Like you'd <laughs> right. like, do your research, you're going to try to like, 
scam people or whatever you're trying to do. Don't tell you, this is the, you know, someone coached you. Here's a thoughtful message to say. So anyways, if I see you doing that, you'll be kicked out. But if you're listening to the podcast, you're not one of those. So we don't need to worry about you, but we'd love it if you join. And I just love um, just seeing the community grow. There's people every day now joining and I just, I just love it. So I think that's everything. Oh, one more thing. Let's see when this launches. I think there'll still maybe be time. We're having a retreat in Colorado. Unfortunately, Raymond can't make it. Um, but we have some spots open if you maybe when this launches, just reach out to me if you want to go. Um, and it's going to be an amazing time in Guffey, Colorado. Um, we'll be riding horses. We'll be doing ATVs, having worship time. And unfortunately, men, this is only for women. <laughs> Sorry, maybe someday there'll be a widower retreat that you can attend. So anyways, I think that's all my announcements. Oh, if you want to be a guest, I'm trying to fill the calendar with guests. So far, there's been so many amazing guests, but I'm excited. Um, or if you're widowed and you know someone else who's widowed, um, send them this way for guests. Okay, I think that's all my announcements. And thanks again, Rainbow, for being here. And everybody have a good day. We'll see you later. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to Widowed Too Soon with Michelle Bader Ebersol. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe, rate and review. And we'd also love for you to join our Widowed Too Soon community on Facebook. See you next time.